I'm sitting here at the Golden Gate Bridge in Northern California today. And what we're gonna be going into is how to stay engaged as you age in your life. So many guys that I see that are over 40 do not live in the body that I wanna live in. They don't date the girls I wanna date. They're not in relationships with girls I'd wanna be in a relationship with. They're not doing jobs I wanna do. They're not laughing, they're not happy. And most of all, they're not engaged. It's gonna be a video talking about how to stay engaged as you age. It's gonna be talking about happiness. It's gonna be talking about lifestyle. It's gonna be talking about what to make out of your fucking life. This is gonna be a lot of powerful self-development content, but also a lot of philosophical content. We're gonna go very, very deep here. So I'm gonna need you to lock in. This video is designed to change the way you think. It's designed to be a little bit of a psychedelic odyssey and expand your mind. So I want you to lock in right now. Get ready to learn. Put your thinking cap on and we're gonna go deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole of how to live an engaged life well into your older age. How are you guys doing? Good. Good to see you guys. What's up, dude? Come on, Sam! Watch me! Watch me! How are you guys doing? Just to even maintain any motivation into your 40s as a man is an art form. Do you guys understand that? In, how many guys you see at age 40 that have a body that you'd want? A girlfriend that you'd want? Okay? How many of you guys here do you see guys like that are 40 that are dating women that are not highly unattractive? Let's be honest, it's very little. How many do you see that are funny? How many do you see that are cool or well-dressed or interesting or charismatic by 40? The, it goes down to almost fucking nothing. Now that said though, the coolest guys who you ever will see are usually over 40. But that's the rare few that actually kept going. And you've, and you've got to and never, ever, ever underestimate how rapidly you will decline to the uncool 40-year-old. Most of you in this room will be the uncool 40-year-old. 98% of you in this room, no matter what we teach you, will be the fucking beaten, you will be beaten down, your face will be kicked into the dirt by the boot of life. You will be a broken, empty shell by 40, most of you. An empty shell. Your hopes and dreams, you'll find ways to rash those, because also, as you age, your testosterone changes, you're kind of chill, you realize that all these like egoic desires that you have are delusional, you're gonna die someday anyway, and then you're like, I just wanna be happy, I don't wanna like change the world anymore, I just wanna like be happy, I don't need to have sex, I just wanna like be happy, but what, what you're doing is the word apathy, you're calling that happiness. You follow that? You're calling apathy happiness. But that's, it's actually just apathy. Have you ever read books like Power Versus Force or Levels of Energy by Frederick Dodson? We oftentimes mistake apathy as enlightenment. Like, oh, I just don't care anymore. Bullshit, shut the fuck up. You're just apathetic, that's all that it is. So keep that in mind. So if there's anything you can learn from some of the older guys in RSD, such as like Jeff or myself, is that it is a fucking art form to keep yourself going into your 40s or 50s or 60s. It's an art form. It requires a massive amount of motivation. Like I get around younger people. Mace, how old are you? 22. 22, so I keep myself around younger people, right? Alexis, how old are you? <laughs> she is over 18. So, okay. So you get around younger people, but you also want to be around older people to older mentors, okay? Firstly, though, like what he's saying, like, you know, you'll be, a, you know, granted, you will most likely be a hollowed out husk of a person by age 40. Um, however, if you manage to, quote unquote, stay on your path and continue to, you know, cultivate these attractive qualities and so forth, that is when you will be at your prime sexual market value. If you can somehow make it, you know, thread the needle and come out cool at 40, you will be, you, it will be the best time of your fucking life. At least three to five of you in this room are gonna do it. Yeah! <laughs> Which three is it? Which three is it? Which three is it? Which three is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> now fight! <laughs> okay. This one's now. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Game of Thrones, right? So, okay, so, so, okay, but the idea that I'm saying is that, like, because I never knew that. Like, when I read the Michael Jordan thing, like, I motivate myself by reminding myself that, um, you know, that there could be that one kid who could be inspired by me in that crowd. When I first read that, when I was in my early 20s or mid 20s, I was like, why do you need that kind of motivation? You're Michael Jordan. You're getting paid millions of dollars. Why don't you just, like, be Michael Jordan? But you don't understand that when you have that much money and you have that much fame, there's no incentive in your DNA to push yourself that hard. Understand what I mean by performing at a high level. It means really engaging. What does engaging mean? Because I think a lot of people don't even understand that. To me, what engagement means is that your mind is firing up.
So even when I'm sitting here speaking to you right now, my nervous system is firing. My mind is firing. I'm in the zone. I'm not thinking at all. I'm no thinking going on up here. Minimal. Okay. Well, I don't know if that's a compliment or that's like, you're like, yeah, no shit. You're, maybe you should think, Owen. But there's no thinking going on. And it's the decision to engage. But it's actually an exertion of energy. Oftentimes after a free tour, my hands are shaking. Um, there was points when I was summoning more energy that I was getting scared. I was getting heart palpitation. I'm not, you probably shouldn't model that. That's probably a fuck up. This will be a cautionary tale video, like when I'm dead next year. And they're like, I had heart palpitation. You should do that too, right? And then they're like, we knew it was coming. Um, but you see the general idea that it's a decision to engage and it's it's a challenge to get yourself to engage when you have a certain amount of cash. So some of my, you guys might see like on my Instagram stories, sometimes I hang out with like tech billionaires. You guys ever seen that? Yeah. In my IG stories, some people who you might, a little bit famous or things like that. And the biggest thing I've learned from these guys that are like tech billionaires or tech, tech guys that have hundreds of millions of dollars is that it's, it's a blessing and a curse to have that much money because on one hand, you can live your life on your own terms. You can travel the world. You can probably have sex with who you want to while you're traveling, you have all this free time to game. You can have cool friends, people wanna meet up with you. But on the other hand, to even get yourself to motivate, to be motivated to do something as simple as even like a talk like this or even anything is almost impossible because your DNA will fight you. Like we have tailbones. Why do we have a tailbone? Because we used to have tails. Where did the tails go? What happened? Why do we lose the tails? Because we don't use the fucking tail, right? Either that or we were like, I don't know, there could be a lot of funny answers to that question. But, you know, getting fucked in the ass, the tail fell off. But we're just gonna go with the base, base level humor. So, but you see the idea, why did the tail fall off? Because we don't need it. When you don't need something, you're not likely to have it. Like for example, how many like really, really hot women do you know where when you like beautiful, stunning women where if you, the first word that you would use to describe them or their characteristics would be integrity? Okay, now that, but that being, but let me ask you a question. As, as like a funny looking, ugly man, at some point in your life, did you ever fuck up, right? You fucked up and you didn't have integrity and then some, because you're an ugly man, it's like, hey you. Ugly little man, haven't you ever heard of integrity? If you don't have that, people, you're gonna be ostracized. And then you're like, what's this integrity shit, right? And then you notice that when you don't have integrity, you start getting ostracized. Now, as a hot woman, like say that I'm dating, who's like the hottest girl out there these days? I don't know, I don't Mendes. watch TV. Who? Mendes. Eva Mendez, I see her. I see, Owen Cook. I see her, I see Eva Mendez at, at um, Whole Foods in LA, sometimes it's not her. So, no, no, she's great, she's great, but you're living in the past, bro. So, she's great, okay, she's great. Okay, she's a great girl, but come on. The basic, okay, who's the hottest younger girl these days? Like, not like 90. Okay, so Ariana Grande. Well, I don't know. Okay. Why don't... Cakes! Yes, she doesn't have the cakes. Okay, so let's just go, let's just go with Ariana Grande. So if, like, say that, say that Big Sean, who used to date Ariana Grande, is like, like, you're thinking of dating Ariana Grande, and then Big Sean is like, what's your name? Ramiz. Okay, Ramiz. Ariana Grande is somewhat lacking in integrity, okay? And then Ariana Grande is rubbing her clit on your cock. Are you gonna be like, wait a minute, Ariana. I've heard from Big Sean that you are lacking in integrity. Now the funny thing is you, if you wanna come associate with me and I hear you're lacking integrity, you are fucked, okay? I will never even look at you if I hear that you're lacking integrity. But Ariana Grande, if she's right pushing her clit on your cock, not only could you hear that that she has lacking integrity, you could hear that she has HIV. And you'd be like, and you'd be like, and you'd be like, I'm not, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to, like, I heard, I've heard it's curable. I heard it can be cured. It takes 10 years to turn into AIDS. Yeah, like, there's 10 good years left. Okay, and you would still at least consider putting it in. And you would at very least still keep her as your friend to get into fucking clubs. So at very least you do that. So that's, so as guys, right, we're always like, that girl flaked and didn't call me back. She's lacking in integrity. <laughs> right, but in reality, even integrity is a function of evolutionary pressure. That's the insight, say that with me. Integrity is a function of evolutionary pressure. It is not the default, it's evolutionary pressure. If somebody hasn't, like to me, when I see somebody lacking in integrity, I'm like, damn, you must be pretty fucking attractive because you get away with this shit, right? I have integrity because 
<laughs> okay? Yeah, like, I like, like, like you guys are smart. Intelligence is a function of evolutionary pressure, right? Like some guy sees some hot girl, he's like, she's not smart. Shut the fuck up, okay? What does your intelligence reflect about you? Okay. <laughs> Self-deprecation, okay? Okay, you guys are like, do we laugh at him? <laughs> what do we say? <laughs> so you get the general idea, okay? Evolutionary pressure um, creates this stuff. So basically, in the same way, when you, when you have a lot of money, it's difficult to engage. It's difficult to make yourself engage. So as you're getting older, it's very, very easy to fall into the rut of like, well, I can go to the gym or not go to the gym. I can go do that amazing project to benefit my life or I can not do it. And so as you get older and your finances, sta say that your finances stabilize at even like 80 grand a year. Let's just call it 80. Now, 80 a year in San Fran, basically you're living in a box. <laughs> but then again, 80 million in San Fran and you're living in a box, <laughs> but it's a bigger box. So, think it, so basically what you have is that if you, even if you're making 80 grand a year, 120 grand a year, 200 grand a year, and then you have like a girlfriend who you get to have sex with every day, even if she's not your ideal, it is very challenging just to get yourself to be motivated because at least when you're young, you have that thing like, I could be anything I want someday. But when you're older, there's this thing called the evaporation of fantasy. Say that word to me. Yeah. The evaporation of fantasy. Yes. What that means is that you're realizing my fantasy life that I was gonna do this or be this, A, I don't know if I even can anymore, and B, even if I do, who cares? Like, let's say that I built RST into a billion dollar company. Yeah. End of the day, do any of you, like you guys all know who Andrew Carnegie is, but do any of you really give a shit about fucking Andrew Carnegie? Like there's some library after him or something? So you're, as you're getting older, you're realizing, even if I conquer the whole damn world like Genghis Khan, it doesn't really matter, I'll be dead. So at this point, I just wanna enjoy myself. But again, what happens? Enjoyment and apathy get confused. And so you become this empty shell slowly because you confuse um, this kind of like apathetic lifestyle as enjoyment. And that's the major distinction is to understand that the purpose of staying engaged in life is not that if you conquer the world that you'll somehow benefit. It's not that even if you had more money, you'd necessarily be happier. Because frankly, even with more money, I think they've done studies on this. I think past like 70 grand a year, maybe it's a bit more now, you're not gonna have that much more happiness for more money. Even, even problems can come. You know, people can target you, sue you, you know, scam you, people asking for handouts, et cetera, et cetera, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it can be a burden over a certain level. And that even hits you too when you realize, shit, this could even make more problems. But the, what you gotta realize, the major reason to keep going as an older man is the engagement itself. So understand that when I'm here in front of this audience or when any of us are here in front of this audience, this is the payoff. Do you guys see that? Yep. This is the payoff. This is the, this is the money. This is the sex. I'm fucking you all right now. <laughs> I just did that for Luke, okay? Me and Luke made a joke that because, because me and Luke are like such fucking retards, we laugh at everything. So we made a joke that what we're gonna do is after every dumb joke that I make that Luke laughs at, we're gonna have a camera back here and I'm gonna pass him like five bucks that he takes. So you see like, my, after every joke he laughs at, then you see my hand like passing the five bucks and he puts in his pocket. He gets five bucks. Okay, anyway, so, um, but you see, okay, so understand that as you get older, like when you're younger, you think the money's the payoff or the sex is the payoff or whatever it is the payoff. The self-image, the ego is the payoff. As you get older, when you realize that all that stuff is kind of bullshit, like, cause as a guy pushing 40, when I hear younger people, they're like, you know, someday I'm gonna accomplish this and I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna be this person. And like with me pushing 40, I'm like, wow. I'm like, you're so delusional that you think <laughs> that that's actually good. And like, we're all just dead. We're like literally just rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. We're just gonna get old and none of this will mean anything. But I love that you still believe that. That you still, Like my favorite is when people get depressed, they're like, this person took advantage of me and this bad thing happened and that. And I'm like, wow, you think it matters. I'm like, that's so cool. Like, I'm thinking of killing myself. I'm so jealous. I'm like, wow, you think you're that important. You don't realize that you're gonna be dead in a couple decades anyway. And then in the course of all history, that that's nothing. Like, I love that someone is, even thinks that they're so important that they're like, I'm killing myself. I'm the, bah! like that, like as if you're so important and as if those decades won't just ooze by anyway. Like the decades will ooze by so quick. So, and I know that's insensitive, but my cousin killed himself and a friend of mine killed himself. And I know it's insensitive, but like honestly, it's like, dude, we're like, you don't even need to do that. Like, it's life will go by in like, like it goes by at my age, years go by like weeks. 
Like one week feels like a year at my age. So you're good at like the dead thing is good to handle itself. You'll be dead either way. Okay? And this thing of like, like, oh, I'm depressed. Look at my life. I was taken advantage of. I'm a victim. It's like, it's like, dude, you're just some random evolved monkey, like just squirming around in a rocker. <laughs> like that. You think you're so important? You think you're so fucking important? You basically, like, you're born into the world. You're in this little playground. You can play in the playground for like five minutes and it's done. Okay? And that's it. So in conclusion, I'd like you, like you guys to expand a couple ideas and we'll make it to the sample of it. But ba the, the main idea that I'm trying to say is, basically, your life is short. You're gonna have a little bit of, a little bit of potency to you when you're young. That's all gonna bleed out of you by the time that you're my age. And like all these crazy things I'm saying, by the time you're my age, it will occur to you. Like all this fucked up shit, you're like, this guy's fucking negative and crazy. And like, what the, like no, like you actually have to acknowledge reality and then find happiness within that reality because the world's gonna end Someday. Like the sun's gonna explode, the galaxy's gonna end. So, whatever we do, it's like, eh, whatever, right? But you wanna find what's fun and engaging for you. And then, you know, if you're young and you really believe that like becoming this thing you wanna be is gonna like make all the difference, go do it. I did. And look, I'm up here, right? <laughs> look at me. But, okay. So, go do it. Like, for sure, do it. Like, I still have big dreams, but I also understand that my big dreams, it's not like when you wait for the dream to happen, then you'll be happy. It's the pursuit of that dream and the engagement towards that dream that is the the juice of itself. Okay, Eminem has a song. I think it's called like Almost Famous song. I'll, I'll maybe list it on the video in the video at some point. But he's like, it's like he like he's saying how fame isn't what he thought it was, but the road to fame, that's the fun part. So for you guys who are learning, say game, realize the road to learning it is the fun part. Even like when you're like, oh, I had a bad night, boo-hoo. Dude, that's so cool that you're that self-indulgent <laughs> that you think that it even matters that much that you had a bad night. Like you have like just to be that depressed, that takes a lot of youthful potency. I don't even have it in me to be depressed. Like, like, like I don't like I don't there's not enough life left in me to be depressed. I'm just like, well, bad night. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you know? Like, right? Like RSD lose like a million dollars from like some the next media fiasco. I'm like, well, there it goes. <laughs> well, we got our video out on Wednesday. Come on, Luke. Like, you know, and then even if something amazing, even if something amazing happens, like, that's great, man. He did it. Well, we're still fucking retarded monkeys on a rock. <laughs> so, you know, but w when you're younger, you're like, I'm going to be this, and this is my dream, and this is my life, and this guy hurt me, but then I won here, and it all seems so dramatic and important, <laughs> and it's so not. So, but as you get older, you'll see that, okay? <laughs> no, kill yourselves now. Get the guns. Wheel in the Kool-Aid. We're going to Mars. Okay, so, but the idea being, like, for me and for any of us, just being out here together and engaging, that's the fun part. So whatever, like whether I accomplish my dream to build RSC to what I'd love to build it to or not, that's not what matters. What matters is the engagement in the process. Kobe Bryant said it because he always wanted to surpass Michael Jordan, right? And Kobe always wanted to pass Jordan. He got five championships instead of six. Kobe was always just like a shade short of Jordan. And what he realized in the end was he wanted to be the greatest basketball player that ever lived, but what matters more is the inspiration that you gave to others in your journey who connected with it. Okay, and I really connected with Kobe's journey, right? So if any of you guys connect with like say the RSD stuff or things like that, maybe I never will pass Tony Robbins, who's probably the biggest public speaker in the world, right? Maybe it could never happen. And you know, always be short. But at the same time, it's like, it's not about who's the best and this or that because Tony Robbins could be the best on planet Earth. Well, guess what? Maybe there's some other guy like Boney Bobbins on fucking <laughs> planet Xenu where L. Ron Hubbard flew from. And you know, <laughs> so, right? And so, <laughs> and maybe he's better than Tony, than, then Boney Bobbins is better than Tony Robbins. And then is Tony Robbins gonna be like, fucking Boney Bobbins. I can never pass that guy. I fucking hate that guy, my rival. I don't even know who he is. So you just gotta enjoy it. Like even for me making a Scientology joke when I'm viewed as someone of a co-leader, to me that is so fucking funny. Like that's my version of, like, which is retarded by the way, but okay, I just know how to build a business properly and have a fan base, but okay. And then, right, just guys, guys that don't understand how to have fans, they use that as, a, as an out. But I, I wanna make it, would you guys like it if I made a business channel called how to build a cult like following yeah. would you guys like that i'm gonna do that shit okay so okay it'd be about business but that'd be one of the topics so but like even when i make a dumb joke like that that is my version of money or winning at this point do you see that like when we go out and we just clown and act like idiots the win is that we clown and acted like idiots that's the win 
It's the fun that you make on the journey. It's that you got yourself to engage or have a bit of fun. I think Jeff is like the master of this, where Jeff will make his life in like this like entire fantasy with like, I don't know what you call it a fantasy, whatever you want to call it, like dark twist of fantasy. fantasy. Yeah, a fantasy with like, you know, <laughs> like the van and his crew in San Fran. Like that's what guys don't get about game is they're, tr is they're trying to like get this certain outcome, but the gaming and the adventure itself is the payoff. The bad night is the payoff. The adventure itself, even being like, oh, it was bad, and I don't know if I'm good, and that's the payoff. <laughs> when you're old, you're not gonna feel like that anymore. When you're 90, you're not gonna be like, oh, I had a bad night, because there's not enough potency there to even engage in that type of thinking. You get like one or two things that you can fucking do. You can do like two things, because you probably have a job, and that's gonna occupy a lot of your time, and then you can maybe like go to the gym, and then maybe get into this stuff, and maybe, or maybe play golf or something that you're passionate about, but you gotta be passionate about something, because if you're not, like my father, he died uh, last year, and from all accounts, I wasn't close with him, but from all accounts, after he retired, he just fucking gave up, and he just kinda like withered away, and then he just fucking died, because he had nothing to do. It was at the point where I went to his house, and there was like piss bottles by the bed. It's like, motherfucker, you can't walk five feet to take a piss? <laughs> when, it, when you got the piss bottles by your bed, that's when you know you're going down. I'm sure some of you are like, I got the piss bottles. I, yeah, I got the fucking piss bottle. Okay, I got the piss bottle too. Okay. <laughs> So, so it's like you gotta you gotta stay engaged. And look, I've had periods of time where you know maybe after a product launch, I'm like, you know what, I've earned it. I, I'm doing well off financially. I'm gonna take a few months off, and I'm just gonna be a blast. I'm just gonna sit around, walk, catch up on fucking Game of Thrones. I'm gonna fucking play Mario Kart. After a couple weeks of that shit, it gets existential real fucking quick. It, it just it's just like, what does it all mean, man? It's like, it just feels like you're in a prison, especially here in San Francisco. It's like this white privilege prison <laughs> where everything can come to the door uh, like on an app tinder bitch comes over to my home like postmates i have a slave that waits in line at fucking arismany baker at tartine bakery for me so i don't have to wait in line for 45 minutes everything just comes to the door but again then i'm like you know what i gotta start i gotta start working again and look i've been teaching boot camps pretty much every weekend for 15 years, okay? So a part of me is like, God damn these motherfuckers. You know, because it's always the same rationalizations every weekend, and you know what, look, Jeffy cares, okay? So I will not, I will not give up on the student, no matter how grotesque the rationalizations are, you know, I'll patiently talk him through and all that stuff, but I gotta tell you, on on my version of Monday Monday morning, going into the office, you know, Friday, Friday evening, as I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go meet these guys, there's that portion of me that's like, oh, here I go to the office. But as soon as I sit down, I'm like, all right, guys, welcome to the boot camp. There's a reason we call it boot camp as opposed to summer camp for little bitches, okay? <laughs> da, 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 da. And then I just get into it. I'm like, bam. A lot of times he'll be like, yo, come out to the free tour. Just talk. I'm like, uh, dude, I don't want you. He's like, come on, just go, just go. As soon as I get up here, it, you can't get me fucking off the damn stage. You know what I mean? Because this, again, like he said, this is the fucking payoff for us. That's a great point, too, of the idea that a lot of the time it's just shifting gears is the hard part. Yeah. Like, when you're in apathy, it's like the train is going on this one apathy track. Once you're in, like, the engaged track, it's actually fun, but the hard part is shifting the track is where it gets A hundred percent. It comes down to, one, being dilute, like, having the delusion that things are gonna work out in conjunction with just being caught up in a loop of the day to day. Like that will fucking kill you right there. If you don't create time and space to take a step back and actually engage with life and not just be caught up in your, your day to day, just going to work, then going into this and that, whatever the pattern is, if you don't take a step back from that, like you, you come. <laughs> <laughs> My hair fell out! <laughs> No, but like <laughs> instantly. Um, but no, you you have to you have to take that fucking step back, and then re-engage. You have to give yourself space and time to self-reflect. That's super key. I'm curious, how many people in here would consider themselves dabblers in this stuff? Like you just dabble around. Keep it a honey. Of game. Of game. Of like, I'm you know I kind of I kind of fiddle around with this shit. I don't really take it very seriously, as opposed to I'm hitting it. I'm going out like five nights a fucking week. I'm talking to a bunch of people. I'm not hands started going down. <laughs> yeah, I'm not just doing this half assery where I go up and be like, um, like the girls walking by and I'm like, 
<laughs> like I mumble some half-ass bullshit. She, she goes like this, huh? And goes by and you're like, guess it didn't work. Did my approach. <laughs> Gotta do five more tonight. <laughs> mumble some more half-ass bullshit. Then go home. I did my approaches. Like that's dabbling. Who does that? Everyone's like, yeah, no one's gonna raise their hand for that, I'm sure. But <laughs> so, you, so what does it take, do you think, to get from a dabbler to like a person who's committed to engaging with this stuff? Commitment. Commitment, but like what gets you, like look, what gives you that idea? All right, motherfuckers, listen. listen. So I, I um, anyone here uh, drink the booze? <laughs> okay, no, only like three people drink in here. Yeah, I believe that. Okay, so look, um, anyone in here do, did, uh, dude, did Sober October with Joe Rogan? I actually did Sober October. Now, what made me, I, I also like went on like an extreme diet. I lost 10 pounds last month. Now, what made me do that? Yeah, whoop you fucking do. It's not that hard, okay? So, so, but like what made me eat fucking kale and like steamed broccoli for a fucking month? <laughs> Look, pain. pain, exactly. I got emotional leverage on myself. Look at this. This is the, um, I don't know if you can see the, the lock screen here. Can we get a close up on that? Wow. On my giant fat fucking gut. <laughs> And uh, it was rather revolting. Now, here's the thing, just to me, to, my, to me personally, because if you know game, here's the thing, like you're not gonna get feedback from the girl. If you know game, they're like, like, ew, you're so fat and gross. Like my fucking girlfriend's like, oh no, it's great. I don't care, it's fucking fine. Like girls think Justin Bieber's fucking jacked, okay? So like, look, it's like they don't even know as long as your personality's on point and you're bringing you know, the emotions and, and the fun and, and so on and so forth. Did you, did you guys catch that point? That's an important point. Uh, yeah. so Mo for most, girl most bodybuilders think that if they don't have like 16 inch arms, like all eight pack, that no girl will ever love them. And like, to most like when I've even been in like decent like if I've got a four pack most girls I'm dating are like ooh abs like like people don't realize that is what he's trying to say and also that the girl and, and also hot women love it when you're out of shape and motivate you to be out of shape why is that why do you why will your super hot girlfriend make you not get in shape because they don't want you they, they don't need some fucking stud running around fucking tagging everything in the town they want to get they want to take the lion and have the lion kind of like like have a sleep. But no, but again, it, uh, the bigger point too is that if you know game, it doesn't matter. Do you understand? Like, um, who's someone I know that's kind of like out of shape? Uh, uh, oh shit, oh shit. Um, yeah, my buddy, I got a buddy. I got a buddy, and, and this dude, do you have any, I, have you seen the man's Snapchat? Oh, it's amazing. Have you seen his fucking Snapchat? It shit don't matter. Now, have you also seen me and Luke doing the reverse motorboat? Yeah. You always have to bring it yeah. to this motorboat. No, I swear to God, I'm, we gotta make a whole video about this. You know, like, there's a big insecurity for men about moves, right? right. They'll make, like, bodybuilders will do videos, like, how do we get rid of moves? Me and Luke are both, like, getting back in shape, but we've gotta make at least one or two videos while we're still out of shape about girls sucking our tits. <laughs> girls, line up. They they line up, they line up to suck on it. They love it, they love it. Okay, we will make a video by the time it's done. Guys that are jacked are gonna be like, oh my God, oh, I knew that's why I'm not getting laid. I don't have moves. Okay, we will, okay, because I, tell them the first time I showed you when we were in Vegas. Yeah, he, he, I believe he was going up to them and saying, would you like to suck my sweaty ass man boobs? Oh, no, old man boobs. My sweaty ass old man boobs. Literally, that was the, the, the verbatim, the, the phrase. Suck my sweaty ass, I believe it's hyphenated, sweaty ass old man boobs. And they're like, oh, sure. I was like, ah, oh, dude, this yeah. fucking But no, lo but, 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 but again, long, long story short, it's even like, it's even more difficult when you, when you have game, because it doesn't matter. You're still gonna get girls. It doesn't fucking matter. So for me, what was the emotional leverage? My clothes weren't fucking fitting. I didn't want to buy different clothes. My, my fucking jeggings, and in case you don't know what jeggings be, okay? So these are, are, look like jeans, but in fact, they're, stre they're stretchy jeggings, okay? It, it's fucking, you can see my moose knuckle, okay? So yeah, so they're actually sweatpants material. Um, and we, I began wearing them on the airplane for, you know, just for comfort on long-term flights. But then I was like, fuck it, just wear them all the time. <laughs> but, but they have this like, they have this like e elastic waistband. So it's like even worse. But then when these things stop fucking fitting, <laughs> that's when it's time. So long story short, I got 
emotional leverage. Like my personal like standards were like, you know what? Fuck this shit. No more. And that's when I was able to be like, every fucking little calorie, no alcohol. People, my friends are like, dude, Fernet. I'm like, fuck off. They're like, you're no fun. I'm like, fuck you. Don't poison treat me, bitch. They're like cranky pants. Like I was like, fuck. You know, and then and then it happens. So again, when it gets to the point where you're like, no mas, you know, ya basta de tonterias, whatever, whatever it takes for you to get to that point, that's when you're gonna be able to move mountains. Like, and, and Boney Bobbins, that's a huge thing in, in his uh, au revoir, if you will, is, is um, the idea of emotional leverage. And also, uh, do you guys wanna hear the story where I got the idea to get girls to suck on your tits? Sure. Oh my God. Okay, so it's a really good, okay, so when you do a threesome, you'll notice that girls love to suck each other's tits. So then I also noticed that sometimes I'd be dating girls and they would shake my tits and they'd be like, hey, you have tits. And then I realized, I was like, wait a minute, if girls wanna suck each other's tits, then why wouldn't they wanna suck a man's tits? And it just dawned on me. And then I was like, let's try it. And then I tried it, and I would just get them to do like a reverse motorboat on me, and they're like, yeah, yeah, like that. And then I did it more and more and more, and it really just spun out of control. Does it feel, does it, does it feel good? You know, I've never been a nip stim guy, but I do it more for them. A what? A nip stim guy. But I do it, I do it more for them. Yeah, I do it, it's more for them. It's, it's actually, for it's, their their, it's for their pleasure. And they really like it too. <laughs> They really do. Yeah. <laughs> it's really cool though. And um, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. You just ask them, you're like, do you want to give me a motorboat? They're like, can I give you a motorboat? And you're like, do it. And they're like, ah. And then they do it. And you're like, more sucking. They're like, ah. And they start sucking. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it takes a little while to get used to it. But it really breaks the paradigm. And that's what I like about it, you know? It breaks the moves paradigm. It breaks the fourth wall on moves for guys. Yeah, while we're Break still out of yeah, wall. while we're still out of shape, we gotta get like I want to do a whole video. I want to do a whole video on just moob sucking before I get in shape. I swear to God, we gotta record this fucking thing because then for every single time that there's these like fitness videos, you're like, how do I get rid of my mood? I'm so insecure, and then they can click on this and like a gr when you have great game, the biggest thing is when you have great game, you make other men insecure that they don't have what you have. Like if you're if you're five foot eight, if you have great game, guys that are six two should feel insecure. They're not. They're like, I feel like I have to keep leaning over when I talk to them. And like that guy there doesn't lean over. He's like the perfect height. I'm insecure. That's what you have to get on people when you have good game. When you have good pimp skills, other men start to fall into your frame and copy you, copy your mannerisms, try to act like you. That's what great game is. But one other quick thought. So Luke also is a guy who, like as far as engagement, I've always been fascinated with his engagement with life. Like you guys know he teaches social circle, right? Yeah. You guys have seen that? Social circle, right? And like he's, and, and what I always like with Luke is that Luke, so there's actually, people will have different kind of levels of, um, of sort of like the way they think. And so some people are more in their own, introspective inner world and some people are more kind of like in the arrangement of their outer world and some people are kind of more in the middle right so how many of you guys would say you're more on the side of like your inner world means more to your happiness and how many of you guys are more like look when my life looks the way it's supposed to look then i'll be happy and by the way most of us are both but who here would put it more on the inner world in inner introspective world? put your hand up who here's more like when my outer world looks the way i want it to look i'll be happy okay so it's a bit it's a bit of both right and you'll also evolve like i think luke's actually kind of like learn more about the inner stuff and so on and so forth. I've learned a lot of outer stuff from him. But I mean, Luke's always a guy who, his view was, you know what? Like, if I want to be happy, I'll make my life fucking happy. And now that goes, you know, in a different realm of thinking from some Eastern philosophy stuff. And then guys get freaked out because it's like a different point of view. And the different point of view is fucking freaking you out because you can't hold two conflicting ideas in your head and not need to resolve them or your fucking brain's going to fucking fry. Um, but what I, I like to surround myself with different types of thinking. So like, Luke, like how do you explain like your desire to like, because you set up like a whole, like, I mean, you've done multiple businesses. You started coaching pick up even on your own before even RSD. Like this guy's been, how long have you been coaching pickup since? Uh, nine years. Nine years, right? Nine years. Okay. And then how would you explain like your, your drive to set up like a crazy sex life or like, I mean, because if you look so at- I just, I just don't want to wait, right? Like, so I don't want to- let, let me pipe it on this first too. I want to say one other thing. Go for it. This is a guy- As long as it's about okay. the moves. Okay. It's about the moves. Well, it is about titty sucking. So they, like, for example, he has a girlfriend. And then him and his girlfriend do a lot of threesomes. And then he also has an entire huge social circle of girls in Vegas. He gets led into fine restaurants for free with like his life is like 
fine restaurants for free, like top restaurants for free with groups of women all eating for free. Free tables, free trips to Cabo St. Lucas on yachts and shit. Any of you guys ever seen Snapchat where he's on yachts in Cabo with like girls like making out with each other and then you can kind of guess what happens after and like all that kind of shit. Have you seen this shit? Yeah. Okay. Have you, uh, like, this dude, he's like, we actually, I can't name the name of it, but like we get the back end of like a highly fancy fucking, can I say the detail? No, 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 no. What I can say here? I mean, Dan or the strip club? The, yeah, the strip club thing. Ooh. Okay. So, I mean, we have the back end of Sapphires. You guys know Sapphires in Vegas? Woo! The whole back end of it, he gets for us for free because he's friends with people there. They just give us the whole fucking back of Sapphires. We like run RSD immersion out of there. Um, this guy, he gets lent Lamborghinis. Like he literally figured out, and, it, and he, he just did this just cause. I mean, he teaches it, but he did it just cause it's cool. How many guys do you know that even have the motivation to do something like that, right? So that's why I always admired Luke is that Luke was like, you know what, like, fuck me and stay, like, fuck, like, he would even, like, joke, like, fuck inner game. I don't even know that's a joke. And, um, <laughs> and like, but, but now he's learned more about it, but the main idea being, he's like, but I like that. Like, I like that line of thinking because sometimes I find that when I'm around guys that are too much inner game, they don't engage. They're just like, I'm in the presence. I'm in the presence. Like, fuck off with the presence. Come on, let's engage. So, and mostly because usually they're confusing presence for apathy. That's actually the main reason, because I'm really more on the introspective side, you guys know that. But like for me, what I found was guys that don't engage, they're, they're not super present like they think they are, because the same guys that don't engage, they get a parking ticket and they're like, motherfucker, fucking parking ticket, fuck the guy. I'm like, I thought you're in the presence, bro. <laughs> it all doesn't matter, bro. I thought, right? Whereas people who engage, typically they're actually more centered in my opinion, because, they, because their presence is being tested, right? So I love people who really engage. But any thoughts, like what drove you to engage at that level? Because I just think that's such a different level than like your, your average guy that's say 40, who's like with his wife that he doesn't like kind of getting bitched at and yelled at versus like cruising around on yachts and Lamborghinis and like have running entire clubs and like women having orgies. Like it's just a total, like think, like stop and really think about that through the mental framework of engagement. Like the decision to even do that. Because any of you guys could have done what he did and yet I predict none of you have. So what makes you choose to engage at that level? What drives you to do that? That's like a question I would ask you. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I basically find that the end isn't really like what it's meant to be anyway. Like you go on this huge journey. It's like almost like that four-hour work week type stuff where you kind of want to live the end result now and not have to wait. For me, it's like, like I knew when I was 10 years old, I wanted the yacht with the girls, whatever the current Daddy Yankee song was that was like popular. I wanted to live that exact life from age like 10 till I was 90. I just didn't know how it was going to play out exactly. So for me, it's like, it's not that I don't like inner game. I just think- No, no you're, you're the guy, you're the guy who's like how do I do the least amount of work yeah. you remember that from the start yeah, yeah. He's that guy, but you actually made it work. Yeah, I mean, I just, like, I love Intergame. I think I love Intergame more than, I mean, Transurfing is the number one book I recommend to people, right? Like, I think, I think Intergame's awesome. I just don't think you can get good Intergame by working on your inner game. I think you have to actually have tangible things that occur. Otherwise, it's just this, like, facade of Intergame. So for me, when, like, the, the Cabo trip was, like, one of the biggest, like, I literally wrote it out on a napkin. I call it napkin pickup, where I was like, well, what do I want to accomplish the next month in my game? And I write it out, and then I see how it plays out. So the comp dinners that you were talking Talking about. It's a lot easier when my day two is a free dinner at SDK Steakhouse with a bunch of girls. And I just, I realized that like, I can think about it all day long, but the only thing that's actually is going to matter is what are the results at the end of the day? What, what do you have to, to show for yourself? Yeah, let's, well, let's actually deconstruct that for a minute. I want to unpack that. Okay, so let's look at a couple different, um, yes. Pack <laughs> it. So what you have is, okay, so you have inner game philosophy, outer game type philosophy, and then kind of in the middle. Okay, so let's look at each one. So if you, who here has ever studied books like The Secret or The Law of Attraction or things like that? Okay, so the idea of that is that whatever inner state that you have within yourself, that will begin to manifest or to mirror in your outer circumstances. So when you change your state inside yourself, like for example, somebody who's very ungrateful, okay, they feel like they're a victim, they feel like they're in lack, will tend to manifest a reality outside themselves that is one of lack. You guys catch that? Who here, do any of you guys have any friends like that where they're perpetually a victim and then for some reason, situations keep arising where they get victimized? Because that's where their reticular activation system is. Google RAS, reticular activation system, if you've never heard of that. Their, their selective focus is always on that. I've dated a lot of girls that I've noticed are like massive victims and even though they're very beautiful and they have a lot of great qualities, and then they're always feeling like I'm screwing them over when I'm really not. And then because 
you'll see this with girls you date sometimes that are really hot, where they're always complaining about the beach they're on, the yacht they're on, the place they got flown out to, and all this shit. And then eventually it becomes your turn, right? Because they're always venting that feeling of victimhood on something. The Zuma event- they can go to. What's that? The Zuma they can yeah, go to. Yeah, like I couldn't go to Zuma, the super fancy restaurant, even though I just got an amazing massage. So what happens is they complain and complain, and then eventually it becomes your turn, and then they put that on you. But then what winds up happening is you wind up saying, I don't want to be around this, and you leave them. Now look what happened. Their feeling of victimhood, their feeling of abandonment, their feeling of lack, their lack of gratitude, actually pushes you away and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Meanwhile, I, I see this when I teach bootcamp clients, right? If I have a bootcamp client on program and the whole time he's just complaining, I'll do my job. I will absolutely be there from the start of what I'm supposed to till the end and I will do, I will work damn hard. But then there's that guy who the whole boot camp is like, this is awesome, this is amazing. And then us as instructors, we're like, this guy's fucking awesome, we love teaching this guy. And now we're out with him till like 11 a.m. the next day, like, we're dying, we just did three nights of boot camp in one night, like how did this guy even trick us into doing this, right? And it's because, but it's because he's having so much fun that it makes us wanna go over. Like when I have a girlfriend and I get her like some stupid ass chocolate bar, she's like, this is the best chocolate bar. I'm like, this made me feel happy giving you this. And then I'm like, take her to a restaurant, this is the best restaurant. I feel happy giving you this. Now I'll give her this, you know, and then I wind up giving her more stuff, right? Versus the victim girl, well, it's always lack. You're just like, well, I don't wanna give you anything anyway. You're just gonna complain. So a lot of the time, like if you're in a, like, if you're in a positive state, for example, then other positive constructive people might wanna be around you more. So in her game, let's say for example, you're thinking to yourself, I gotta go hustle on my business and I'm gonna go grind it out all day. It's gonna be miserable. And then another part of you is like, maybe I'll go take a walk in the park. Well then you're like, you know what? It would feel good to go take a walk in the park. So you go do it. From one framework that could be called lazy. From another framework, maybe you're, you're in such a good mood, kind of following your truth in that moment, that you wind up meeting some super high level person. And then that high level person introduces you to another person. That other person shows you a trick not to have to work that much and then introduces you to a business connection that makes you 100 times more money than if you would have grinded it out. You see that? So sometimes, so that's an inner game based philosophy. You're in your most constructive state when you're positive. You're, you're marshalling the most resources when you're positive. You tend to get better friends, manifest better situations, focus on better things, and it can go up. Now here's the flip side. Many people that are, let's go with the other side. Many people who are very into the inner game stuff, it is shocking how averse they are to hard work. It's unreal. So if Luke will describe, you know what, let's plan out on a napkin how to get to Cabo, how to have the girls all doing an orgy, how to be on the crazy yacht, how to go to the best restaurant, how to go there on a private plane and do it all for free or even get paid doing it, which Luke does. Um, in fact, I think he even made 30 grand doing that. Yesterday. Okay, yesterday. Okay. Yeah. I worked really, I worked really hard on that yeah. one. Because, because, because. Go Astros. So, he, so what happened was, the guy who, who was doing a lot of that stuff is like a gambling guy, gave him a tip for like the, for the Astros to win in seven, he took it and then he just made 30,000 fucking dollars in a day. So that's a classic example. Guaranteed every day. Yeah, so see now Luke, so now, so now Luke's a manifestation guy. So now Luke is like all about the secret. He's gonna have like a secret shirt now. Whole thing. Yeah, but, but you see the idea, right? But a lot of people that are into like that, the secret stuff, they're afraid of hard work. So many of like my spiritual mentors, when I tell them I'm gonna go spend 12 hours working with my video team to like edit multiple videos or to shoot or to come here and work the whole time, they're like, whoa, whoa, why don't you just focus on being positive? <laughs> and I'm like, dude, shut the fuck up. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. You're broke. Fuck you. I'm like your only paying client. You're an incredible coach. <laughs> fuck you. And so, okay, so you see the main, and yet they're amazing people though, right? They're incredible people. So, so you see that, like that's a big thing in LA in the spiritual community. They're literally, like, like I have a chiropractor, God bless her heart, but every time something goes wrong in her business, she's always talking about how she's gotta manifest a better employee, manifest a better marketing, manifest this. Man. I'm like, bitch, just sign me a marketing book. Like, can I give you a marketing book? No, that stresses me. That takes me out of the presence. Shut the fuck up, read the fucking marketing book, get the fucking napkin out, plan it out and execute. Shut the fuck up, You're, you've, been, you've been mismanifesting for 10 years since I've known you. It's not gonna change, okay? But it's just the truth, I love her. That's why I'm mad. I love her. That's why it makes me mad. So we only get mad at those we love. Okay, people I don't care about, I don't even bring up. So the main idea being is that there's a balance in it, right? So you wanna learn from people that, that have all angles of it, but also the manifestors, the inner game ones, don't mistake them just being in the presence or happy, like in a lot of the, a lot of this like kind of self-help literature with them actually being engaged. It's oftentimes pure apathy, the lowest vibration that you could have. It's and you'll see the incongruencies come out. 
Yes, the precious. The presence. The presence. Mm. The secret of Guthrie Ranker thing, anyway. The se- it could be. Like, yeah. So Wait, that's that'd be a whole other video. How ironic is that? Yeah, that could be a whole other video. But keep going on the on this. The setup. Which part? Okay. Yeah. What drives you to build all this? I mean, like the like the end isn't worth it anyway. So you you meet all these people that retired so they could live this beach lifestyle, and then they go to the beach and they realize that beaches kind of suck. You know, they go like <laughs> like I, I've, I've been on a- even more depressing, right? It's all worthless, even the beach. We went down. Let's just keep <laughs> going. No, like I, I mean, like so I, I mean when I was so like I used to write softer, right? And I remember um, right kind of as I was like getting into pickup and like changing my life from this match 401k software engineering job into so then going into this pickup thing, it was like, I remember I spent a couple months just like doing, like I had a couple friends who like sold a tech company. I remember I just kind of like hung out with them and I was like, they just wanted to like do my ties on the beach. And I was just like, after two days, I was like, this is the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. Like, it's like a body of water. It's kind of like this digital nomad thing. Like the guys do, you know, this like, they want to travel into the, the Shopify store and they want to like, this whole goal right now is to like travel every week to a new city. And I like, I, it's just such a waste of time. Like at a certain point, the grocery stores are the same. The gyms are the same. The, like traveling is such a waste of time. Sometimes I think people who don't get to travel wish that they could travel. Yeah. To be fair, how many cities do you travel to this week? Like six, seven. <laughs> but like, but he like, is the hot girl now. It just no, but it's it's just like it's, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> but like, but I guess the point I guess I'm trying to make here is that like it's it's just it's like everything once you do it is immediately not worth it once you've done it. Like the Cabo thing, right? For a long time, like I've done the whole bottle like the whole like bottle service in Vegas clubs thing, and then Miami. Me and it's like my friend owns Rockwell, my other friend owns Marquee, and it's it's this thing which are two really good clubs in Miami and Vegas. And at a certain point, like when I walk into Marquee, I already know all of the girls that I would potentially hook up with. I've already I'm already Instagram friends with them. I already kind of sort of know who they would be. At a certain point, once you meet all these people, it's just like the the act of doing it. You know, this whole like kind of uh, the journey is better than the destination thing just becomes very very true. Because once you do it, the second it's it's like after you have sex with a girl, you realize the next three seconds how much you actually like her or not. It's like once, once you, it's like once you, once you come, you realize, do you want her to get the fuck out of your bed? Or do you like, are you, are you okay with minding her presence? You know what I mean? It's like, that's how much you like it. It's the same thing with, you know, this whole Cabo thing. It was kind of my dream for a long time to just literally do the, like the girls on the yacht next, you know, with Desposito playing or whatever that song is. It's like, you know what I mean? It was like, that's kind of the thing. He was dreaming about Desposito even before Desposito was out. I, no, cause it was like the, before Desposito was that, it was that Don, it was like that Don Omar song where the guys on the boat and he's like hey bro where are you at he's like oh i'm at my mansion and the guy and the guy's like oh come on pick me up and it's like this 200 foot boat he's like hey i'll be right there girls are just twerking in the background so i was like i just want to live that music video every day forever so then the other day we were in cabo and i was like i just like hey let's do it and then like two and a half hours later we had the girls twerking in the boat and then the, everything just kind of come together and then once it, i know because i was whacking off to it <laughs> and then he sent me the videos of the and then I replied, and then, and then, and then, like as it was happening though, like once it was over, I had this weird void. Who feeling. here? Wha- who here? Wax off to Luke Snapchat? Come on. <laughs> okay, that's good. Sigma Delta. Sigma Delta. Ro- Ro- yeah. Sigma Delta does it. But is it is it hard when you whack off and the Luke jumps in the photo? Because I find that to be the best part. <laughs> I, wa- I, wa- I want you to provide something to come. Yeah. So I, I, I really wanted that. It's called jerk off encouragement or JOI is what they call yeah. it. Yeah, that's our next product. Yes, JOI. Mm. So anyway, that it actually is because you have a porn product coming out. I do. He actually does have jerk off encouragement coming out. I forgot. That was a not. That, that was like a six out of ten joke that was real. To turn it into a yeah. ten out of ten. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a part where I'm taking the vibrator and fucking her with it, <laughs> teaching you how to use a dildo on a girl as she uh, orgasms all over my. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's, no, it's real. It's not a joke. He did it. Like I was joking, but I wasn't. Okay. Yeah. This gets weirder. We're going down the rabbit hole of weirdness. It just keeps going. So as we unpack it further. I like how too how everybody thinks that RSC is this like well-run business. <laughs> and like they don't realize like like they're doing like I, my greatest compliment is when people be like they're using NLP to like hypnotize the crowd and like meanwhile like like What's people will think that and like yeah and, like <laughs> and me and Luke meanwhile are like then we're gonna make the porno product. We're like ah, yeah. <laughs> no, 
you know what I think? The, I think the bigger thing is if people think that any business is actually a well-run business, or any government, for that matter, is a well-run government. It's like people are derping at all levels. Yes. <laughs> the derping just goes all the way to the top. The goal of this business is to be as everywhere. yeah. The goal of RSD for anyone working is to be as retarded as possible. Like it's actually like how correct. Like like when you see us making out like five girls at a time, that's not like some business move. That's just like one, and they're like. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, two, uh, like, three, <laughs> four, <laughs> and that's like, that's all we're doing all day. <laughs> in the jeggings. It's like nonstop. It's like relentless. It's like every day, day in and day out. Mm. Yeah, don't think about the jeggings. Oh, no, because, well, the jeggings thing, we do that to be comfortable while we pimp. So these are jeggings, and I have, like, thick lighters in this. And also, have you guys tried the Adidas Ultra Boost yet? No. Those are fucking amazing. That's the, okay, anyway. Okay, so keep going what you're saying. Yeah, Ultra Boost. Yeah, you got to be comfortable while you're fucking running shit. Okay. Um, yeah, no, back to the whole thing, right? I mean, it's like the, the architect of it, right? You being the architect of your own life is super important. I, I, the big reason why I got into it is I just see, start seeing guys who are in-game, like in-game, quote-unquote, for a really long time, like four years, just kind of on this hamster wheel, running up and down the street, doing the exact same thing over and over again. I was like, well, where is this leading to? Like, I, don't, I just didn't want to be... I, I want to know two weeks from now how much better or worse I am than two weeks prior. And that's kind of, it's not like I based my inner game on it, but at the same time, you know, your confidence goes up a lot when you can tangibly adjust different things in your life, right? Okay, so let's unpack that one. This is very, very important what he's saying. So a lot of people that study pure inner game, what they do is they're, they're trying to trick the mind into like, like we are all one. One consciousness, the universal consciousness, da, 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 da. And, then, and what happens is you study that waiting to be happy. And what Luke is saying is like, dude, like that's really great, but it's, you know what else makes it easy to be present? When you're on a boat in Cabo with six girls sucking your dick. And so he's look, you know, when you've got a big group of friends and so on and so forth. So it's just coming at it when you're living your dreams. So when you're coming at it, from different angles. Like there's many different angles that you can come at it from. So I'm somebody that actually, I create a lot of controversy because I've studied the inner game stuff so thoroughly and I live it to the greatest degree that I'm able to. So I'll teach a lot of spiritual ideas or Eastern philosophy ideas. And then when people see me teaching say business oriented stuff or even game, they're shocked. They are shocked and appalled. And then also a lot of my friends that are really into business, well, you know, I've done over $100 million in uh, sales of digital programs and live events in my life, and I've done a lot of interesting business stuff and marketing, and I know a lot about that, and work ethic, and hustling, and game, and getting laid. So people will study that, and then they'll hear me talk about inner game, and you're like, do you associate with those fucking losers? Oh my God, right? But what I always found was I like both sides of it. So, and, and I feel that inner game and outer game feed into each other. So my whole thing is like, if you're alive here on this earth, then you should learn about inner game because you can have everything in the world, but if you haven't shifted your inner game, you might not be able to enjoy it. And then likewise, and in fact, it can actually make you insane. It can make you literally crazy. I remember when I had, um, I think I was making like 20, 30 grand a month for the first time in RSD, living on an ocean, um, living in front of the ocean, hot girlfriend, eating in five-star dinners every night. I was like, you know, my mid-20s, and I, and I was surfing every day or bodyboarding, and I was still unhappy. And I felt crazier than ever because it was like I had everything I thought I wanted and I was still miserable. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even saying it's crazy. The happiness thing is a whole different topic entirely, right? Like, happiness is a choice. There's not, like, even as I'm architecting all this stuff, it's like, it's not like I need the yacht in Cabo to be happy, but it's like, it, like not having it also doesn't make me happy, mm -hmm. right? It's like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. like anybody who says that like having a lot of money doesn't make you happy, suddenly imply, like they're, they're trying to tell you that like having a lot of money will make you unhappy. Say the word apathy justification. Say that with me. Apathy, apathy justification. justification. Maybe that should be an RC buzzword. Is that the best way to put it? Buzz. Apathy, a, apathy, buzz phrase, yes. Apathy, <laughs> apathy justification. So a lot of these inner game arguments are essentially apathy justification. Notice that the engagement that you get with building, say, the yacht situation, that decision to engage forces you to be present and forces you to engage with what you're doing. Then when you're on the yacht, you're like, hey, you know what? I feel gratitude, I feel good. And not just because I'm on the yacht, but because I enjoy the entire process of it. So the rich guy whose parents gave him the money to be on the yacht, it's a very different context than somebody that doesn't come from money and, and has the self-esteem and sense of self-worth and, and, and efficacy of making a choice, like putting together a plan and executing that plan and being like, yo, 
I put this together. This is fucking cool. And so that's the, to me, that's where the joy is, is like, we're here alive. We make a plan. We engage with the plan. And then we enjoy the fruits. We're grateful for the fruits. And then we make another plan. And then we do that to when we're older. And then when we're older, we can kind of just like meditate out our final decade or so, right? But you don't need to meditate out, you know, your 20s. You know what I'm saying? Okay. But that said, I'm an avid meditator. I meditate 20 minutes a day. I work with spiritual coaches. I've read every spiritual book I can get my fucking hands on. I'm sure I'll read the rest of them at some point. And I love, I work with Julian, Transformation Mastery, all that kind of stuff. So there's a balance between the two. Quick question on it, then we're gonna go to social media topic in a sec. <laughs> Louder. Owen, because you engaged in the process and you got what you wanted from engaging in the process, mm -hmm. why were you miserable? Because you, you achieved something through that engagement. Okay, so now imagine me growing up. So I've grown up. And I'm fucking, I'm depressed as fuck. I used to think about suicide all the time. I'd be walking home from school, and sometimes I'd become so apathetic that I'd lay down in the Canadian snow for five or six hours because I didn't feel the will to live. And I'd go through this, okay? So I just, be, I mean, it sounds crazy, but like, what did I really have to live for? Like, as crazy as that sounds, how is that irrational? I wasn't gonna be getting sex. I wasn't gonna be doing well. I was just gonna go back into an abusive environment, get picked on, get isolated. There was nothing that would make, what, what was I walking to? To watch television? What was I walking to? I remember once I watched every season of the show Dallas, and that was my greatest <laughs> happiness. <laughs> okay, who shot JR? You guys don't even remember this shit, I'm old. So I watched the reruns of it on TNT, the Nashville network, okay? So, so like, <laughs> you're laughing at me. This is my story of pain. This is, this is my life. You watch uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is my life. I was a victim, okay? So now, at that, so at that point, then, okay, now I was like a crazy kid also doing like a lot of stupid, dumb shit in my high school years at the same time. That at least gave me some kind of engagement. And then from there, here's what happened. I wound up getting into Queens University. So when I got into a good college, okay, that's in Canada. So you guys never heard of it. And also the capital of our country is called Ottawa. And we all drive dog sleds to work and we live in Igloo. <laughs> so, so, okay. <laughs> and, our pre, and our prime minister is more loved by women than yours. <laughs> so, okay, our prime minister doesn't grab him by the pussy, okay? That's true, okay, our prime minister doesn't grab him by the pussy, our prime minister gets his pussy grabbed. So, <laughs> that's good shit. Just came up with that. That's the win, okay? So, just because he wears a little pink ribbon doesn't mean he has a pussy. Now, so what you have is, um, so I'm doing that. So then I get into a better school. And for a lot of people, I think college is a waste of fucking time. For a lot of people. For other people, it could be good. But for me, college is actually amazing because I was away from the fucking degenerative environment I grew up in and around optimism. Then in my first year of college, um, I was still kind of miserable, but at least I had hope. In my, and by the way, the kids at school at that, at that college were so shocked that I was there because they all thought that they got in this great school and then they see fucking Owen Cook <laughs> is in the school and they're like, Owen? They're like, you go here? I'm like, yeah, I'm here too. <laughs> right? So, because I was a failing student until my sixth year of high school. So, uh, delinquent. So, I was out of control. So, so now from there, so that was pretty satisfying. So now from there, um, I had my girlfriend for my first year. She dumped me around the end of my first year. And then I um, was miserable, like in a cloud of hell for about another six, eight months to a year. And then I started learning the pickup stuff. And I started applying it. And now, unlike most of you guys who think it's supposed to work within a week, and you guys are spoiled little bitches, for me, I, I knew that that I had no hope. So for me, even when a girl talked to me for 10 seconds, I was like, dude, a girl talked to me for 10 seconds. Oh my God, I asked her the time and she fucking answered this time. This pickup shit's amazing. And I was so happy because I because I had gratitude, unlike victims who fucking whined like everything like little bitches. I had gratitude for even a girl at answering what time it is because I couldn't even get that. And so what happened was um, I just kept building on it. I get maybe a one minute conversation, a two minute conversation. At one point I got to a five minute conversation. I was shocked. So that, now it took years for me to learn this. That's why I keep doing it because every time I do a pickup now I'm like it's, it's working it's working when am I going to wake up from this weird dream it works <laughs> so now all of a sudden pickup works for a while and then I wind up getting laid for a bit then I wind up getting a girlfriend and then I wind up starting to grow my business but those uh, that underlying darkness that I grew up with was 100% still there so now I'd be surfing on a uh, like bodyboarding in on a wave in Hawaii with my hot girlfriend waiting on the shore about to go to a five star dinner but the neurological conditioning and the mental frameworks that I have haven't changed. So that victim thinking, low vibration energy, trauma energy, um, focusing on the negative, none of that changed. But the thing is, that back in the day, you had this dream or fantasy that if I got what I wanted, finally this feeling of pain would go away. 
but now you have what you want and you feel the exact same because you're conditioned to feel that way. And the epiphany for me, what happened was I thought, so this is why I never take away from anybody to kind of go on your journey to make your money or to get laid or, wh or whatever it is the guy you're trying to do. Because in the process of me getting everything that I thought that I wanted, that drove me into the inner world. Because what happened was I got what I want on the outer world. It doesn't mean that I had a billion dollars. A lot of people could still do way better. Don't get me wrong here, right? But for me, like where I was coming from, it was really cool. Like I was excited about it. So now I've got what I thought was really cool. I still feel the same. And then I'm growing RSD at that time, and I'm fighting to get approval for my Tyler persona. So as I'm fighting to get approval for my Tyler persona, and as more and more people like me and think I'm cool because of my Tyler persona, I'm realizing that I'm starving my actual self-esteem because my ego is getting gratification. So if you have this kind of persona or this ego that you're doing to get approval, and it's actually working to get you approval, you're losing out on what you kind of cheese cheesily called unconditional love, because people, there has to be a feeling that you, that you have self-love, or that people, at least the closer people in your life, not like distant people, but the closer people in your life love you just for you. And so the more that I was feeding into my ego, I was starving my self-esteem. And then what happened one day was I got so stressed, and it was like this vice grip closing in on me that my brain just fucking tweaked and I had what in spiritual growth, what at the time to me felt like what's called a Satori experience. Have any of you guys ever heard of a Satori experience? Yeah. So Satori experience is when you get what's, you know, if you've ever read books like Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now or A New Earth, that's kind of like the, the, the kind of entry point into Eastern philosophy and the idea of not thinking and being present to the moment and that happiness is actually your default state when you stop thinking and when you just enjoy what you have. So my, my thinking shut off for almost four days. And I, I, could, I, wasn't, I was just like aware. And I was walking around my house. And you can tell this is years of stress that was building, okay? Years and years of stress building up to this. So this was kind of a long time coming. So now I also wanna be clear too. To me, what felt like an experience of enlightenment at the time would be me at like a two out of 10 of where I would feel now. Do you understand what I'm saying? But where I feel now might not be that much different than any of you. It's just that it was relative to how low I was at the time, okay? So I was so trapped in my head at the time and so, so buried in there that even if sense of normalcy was like euphoria to me. So what happened was I felt this euphoric feeling without thinking very much for almost four days and I had to reconsider everything. And that's what happens when you have a Satori experience. You're like, well, why am I working if I just feel happy? If I just feel present, why do I do anything? Why do I even wanna have sex? Why do I even wanna make money? Why do I wanna do anything? Because you're present for the first time. Now what happened was, it's like a pendulum. So first I went super present, can you guess what happened after? I went into such darkness for about a week after because there was like a hangover. I mean, maybe someone just slipped me ecstasy, I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe my serotonin was fucked up. <laughs> but basically, I went in such darkness after, I became physically sick. Um, I, was, I could feel all these like demons in my head and shit like that. And then what happened was maybe like a while later, I became, oh, then I, then I sought out the power of now. Now, people had sent me the Eckhart Tolle stuff earlier and I thought it was stupid because he's like this old guy in a vest and he talks really slow and he's like, oh, I... Um, in the, uh, the, the, now, now here a bell ding, you know, and you're like, what the fuck is this fucking guy? Like, what fucking idiots watch this? Is what I'm thinking, right? Like, I'm like, well, you can make money doing anything. <laughs> um, you can sell any shit. And then, um, and then, so I'm looking at that. And then all of a sudden, after I'd had that experience, I was like, oh, that's what happened. So people have been kind of referring me to that book. So then I reread that book like 100 times. I reread uh, A New Earth like 100 times. And then everything changed for me. Now, even though that would say, now at the moment, I'm like, did I become enlightened? No, I didn't. I basically just went from a living fucking hell to some semblance of normalcy. And then what will happen is as you move through your progression internally, you'll have those tutorial experiences. So for me, like even when I just go out to game, every time that I game and it's a good night, I have a similar experience to what I had many years ago. So for me, game is the ultimate Satori experience where we get so present and laughing and having fun. And you know, that's why guys say to me like, you still game when you're 38? Oh, that's fucking stupid. I'm like, dude, this is, this is a completely different meaning to me. I'm getting something completely different out of this at this point. How many of you guys are addicted on game because of the state that you get out of it even more than say getting laid? Anybody put your hands up? So it's funny, right? It's the greatest joy in the world, like being in a lucid dream. So that's kind of like what'll happen as you go back and forth. But what you'll find is people get a attached 
to the presence. They get attached to being present to the moment. And then what I found over time was, no, I've got to backtrack. I've still got to engage. And then it's in the process of doing a seminar, like for, for my lifestyle, you'd have your own lifestyle. A seminar, maybe whatever you do for work. Gaming, working on a launch, going out and, and, and having fun with my friends, teaching a boot camp, doing the things that we really love, and then that has an inner connotation to it, but it also has an outer connotation. And I have to be careful because I'm, it's so easy for me at this point to be happy, and I'll show you how in a minute if you want to, I'll show you. It's so easy for me at this point to be in a good mood that I have to be careful that I don't just go into a cave. My comfort zone is going into a cave, okay? And, the, and, and by the way, it's so simple to be happy that it's illusory. Do you guys see what I'm saying? It actually hides from you in plain sight. Here's all that it is. Your default state is to be happy. So who here does meditation? Put your hands up. Some of you guys learned that from RZ. Okay, so now watch this. So meditation is the idea that you stop thinking. Now, if you stop thinking, then of course what happens? You're like, well, I can't think. Oh wait, I had a thought, I fucked up. So rather than trying to not think, I'll just do a, it's gonna be like, you know, your, your 90 second meditation tutorial, then we'll jump into, um, I like to jump into social media. So what you have here, okay, we're gonna do this. He knows me, stop calling me out, you fuck. So, so watch this, okay? So what you have, so just try breathing in and focus your awareness, just don't think, just focus your awareness on the breath. If you happen to think, then just let it pass, but draw your awareness onto the breath. Do you breathe in? Let it go. Breathe in. Let it go. And just allow your mind to rest where it is. So you're not waiting to be happy. And so what happens is when you do that, you get a little drip of presence. But when you stay in that state, the dripping keeps coming in and present energy keeps dripping into you and you get crazy fucking present and it's a very euphoric feeling. Now, right now, just think of what it's like to be happy and watch this, here's the other key of it. What we do is we put a condition on being happy. I have to get this to be happy. Just skip the middleman for a moment, skip the middleman, and just let your, like, while being present, just be like, just do that. Like, just let the happy feeling come in your body. <laughs> now, and then take a deep breath. And again, just let the happy feeling just, just be like, just be like. <laughs> okay, take a deep breath in. Let it out. Give a big smile as you're doing it. Okay. Make it like a loud, funny sounding breath, like. <sighs> and then, <laughs> ah. Shake your body a little bit, shake a little bit. Stay present with me. Breathe. So who here can feel their, their happiness go up at least a point or two or three? Put your hand up right now. Okay. That's called being an adult. You now know how to control your emotions. You don't, you don't have to be a little fucking, you don't, okay? Okay? Like, you don't have to be a little whiny little bitch who's like, I feel sad, I feel sad, right? Just control, be present, control your fucking emotions like an adult, be happy, and then whatever bullshit is in front of you, deal with it from that state. But a lot of you, do you ever feel kind of like, if you're not mad, you won't deal with it? You'll be unmotivated? You ever feel that way? So you've got to train yourself, hey, just because I can control my state very easily, I've still got to do things. I've still got to take action from that happy point. You've got to be very, very cognizant of the conditions you put on f for everything that you do. Not even just happiness, but your work ethic too. Too many people put on the condition that I need to be passionate in order to put in a crazy work ethic. And that's just, it, that's false. You can just go put in the work, the passion that you're looking for that everybody else has will come. Be cognizant of those conditions. Well, everyone's listening to Jocko Willink, right? 
like the Jocko Willink. Like, yeah, talks about how motiv- motivation's overrated. Like, like so many times guys want to like wait until they're motivated for something to for them to like push them into a certain situation. Like, the, the motivation rarely comes that in that kind of like a wave. You just have to have discipline to do it. If you want to, if you want to achieve like. You know, with Jeffy, with what he was saying, with either like not drinking for a while or fitness or whatever, motivation is not strong enough. You know, Mo- like even like strong motivation, you have to pick a goal and then reverse engineer the steps to do it, and just have discipline to do it every day, rather than actually waiting for your mind to emotionally charge you into HV to do it. Yeah, who here's read um, "Relentless" by Timothy S. Grover, the coach of the uh, Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan, Dwayne Wade? Okay, read that for sure. That's like pornography for entrepreneurs. Like you read that, you're like, oh, tell me I'm a cleaner, Timothy. Call me a cleaner, Daddy. Is that why your pages stuck together when you handed me the book? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Relentless by Timothy S. Grover, pornography for, like, hard workers. And, um, and so what you'll see is, what he says is, like, don't, like, look at the two different paradigms. So one paradigm is follow your passion. The other paradigm is don't wait for there to be a passion. They're conflicting paradigms, and you don't want to get stuck in one paradigm. So what is the advantage when Steve Jobs says, find your passion? What does he mean by that? Just throw out some answers at me. Come on, guys, wake up. What's that? Wake, speak up. Whatever you love to do. Why, did, why, would, why would Steve Jobs say it's important to have your passion and to follow it? Because you won't give up. Give up as easy. He says you won't give up when it gets hard, right? Like, do you think the fact that, like, let's look at an example. Me, 19 years old, walking in the snow, lying there, feeling like I wish I'm dead, lying in the snow, getting frostbite, and the only thing motivating me to walk home is, like, physical, like, possibility of death. Then I walk home. Then, like, no girls talk to me, and I just masturbate again and again and again and again and again. And, again. <laughs> and then I do that. Why do you think I make so many jerk-off jokes? Because I spent decades just jerking and jerking <laughs> and jerking. Like, where do you think this came from? That gave me the passion to make these jerk-off jokes now, not to give up on my dream of lacing in obnoxious not that funny jerk off jokes into every seminar for the world to hear. And so all that, that, that gave me, so that gave me the, that gave me the, the drive that when I teach game, when I've got that client who's not that good at game and I'm with him till all hours of the night, cranking and cranking and cranking and hustling through it. He's having a hard time and we're pushing him and stay and we're taking him through it. Well, that gave me the passion to persevere whenever difficult things happen. Well, so that's where I follow your passion, right? But then other people will see like a lot of the time the bar, parts of RC is hard and they're boring and then people are like well you should just outsource all of it and it's like dude you can outsource a lot but there's still a lot of dry boring shit that you have to deal with in a business and so the passion it, you know it fuels me in the fun parts like doing a, an event like this or doing a boot camp but there's a lot of stuff that's really fucking boring and what I see in LA is you get a lot of these artists who hire on managerial teams and they completely delegate everything to their business team and they wind up fucked and you see that all the time so if you don't engage with it to some extent, you wind up, fuck, I mean, I even need to do more clearly, but you see the main idea. So that being the case, that's the argument for following your passion, okay? It makes you more aware of the details, the nuance. It makes you more competitive. It makes you better at what you do. Now, why, what would be the argument like what Luke's talking about for not following your passion? Where can this go very wrong? Let's look at it. Let's unpack it. Let's unpack this and flesh it out. Like, Unrealistic. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, like that's a great example. Like, you know, what I, like you see this in LA all the time. The girls I talk to, I'm like, what do you like to do? They're like, drink. And then you're like, well, other than drink, be famous, right? And you're like, what would you be famous for? <laughs> right? And the thing is, and the rise, and my, drinking, right? And the rise of guys like Logan Paul have made this so much worse. Where Logan, like, they just see Logan Paul, like, hey guys, I'm Logan Paul. And then they're like, I can do fucking vlogs like this, but they don't understand. He's got, like, Team Ted and all these people, like Dan Fleshman, all these people behind him that are pumping him up. You don't have that behind you. Okay? He's famous for being fun, but he's also kind of famous for being famous too. It's a bit of both, right? Kind of go hand in hand. So, the, you know, he's like, great, fun guy and stuff, but it's also famous for being famous too. Like, Kim Kardashian. Like, like, people see that. Like, I could be like Kim Kardashian. Like, no, you can't. Like, there's like one or two of those that are famous for being famous that we watch because we're just like, how the fuck is she famous? Like, that's why we watch it. But there's also like a million reasons why she's famous, right? People think that she just like stumbled upon it. Mm-hmm. They didn't realize that she was. She got banged by Ray J. Yeah, there you go. And then they're like, and then they're like, I'm gonna fuck guys like Ray J. And they in video, they think they're gonna. Okay, hold on. That's another video. I mean, like, like Chris, like her mom made her in a factory. Right, mm-hmm. but, you know, I mean, like you, you take guys like Logan or Jake, right? Like, there's these teams and teams of people that created them. They didn't like pick up a camera and just like, hey guys, what's up? There's just like so much stuff. I'm goes. seeing all these disappointed looks right now. Like that fucking vlogger shit's down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
Okay, so you see, so the main, but let's look at the not, okay, so one of it is a stupid passion, right? Like, I, like, okay, this is the worst shit for me. Like, I got friends in LA, and they're like, I'm gonna be, like, a famous DJ or an actor, and, like, every time I'm like, don't, don't, right? And then it's the same shit. You're stopping me from living my dreams, right? Okay, we're naming some friends for us. So like, you're stopping, you're stopping me from living my dreams, right? Now, what do you say that? I'm a fucking self-help coach. And like, what's my job? What is my fucking job? To make people live their fucking dreams, okay? So... Now, there's one level like learning game, right? Anybody can learn game for the, I mean, now guys always want to give me like, like the, the elephant Titus guy who's like in, he's like a foot and a half tall. And, and I'm like, I don't know. I never even met a guy like that. But okay. And in fact, the one guy did me like that, Sean Stevenson's amazing and he has a hot girlfriend. So I don't even know. Like, do you guys know him? Sean Stevenson is like a totally mate. Look, Google this. This is incredible. Okay, Sean Stevenson is an inspiration, okay? He's like this big, and he's like more of a pimp than any of us, okay? So go look this guy up. So now, but from there, what you have is like any normal person could learn game. So when we say you could do a two for game, that's because even if you're a little fucking heinous troll, because girls respond to need for validation, high emotional state, and leading, any little heinous little guy can learn that, and he can at least get a cute girlfriend over at some point. So any guy can learn game. But the thing with like being, say, a movie actor is it's not all on you. You're needing to get chosen by a studio. A lot of that shit is arbitrary. It's like when guys come to us, they're like, I'm gonna be the next RSD instructor. I'm like, no, you're not. And they're like, yes, I am. And I'm like, I'm RSD. Tyler and I'm telling you you're not and and then they're like no they're like you don't understand this is my dream and I'm like well this is my dream and it's you're not and then they're like well why and what they don't even realize is like like Jeff got pulled into RSD because he was just kind of there when in San Francisco Maze like showed up at my house and I was like I need instructor and then Luke we needed an immersion guy so you're thinking that it's all like so perfectly fucking chosen and you don't realize I'm a fucking idiot okay I'm a fucking moron and so you're basing all your dreams on the fickle decisions of, of Owen. Do you know how fucking retarded that is? You've got to choose your, okay, I'm massively exaggerating this guy's high school, but you see my point? Like, I'm trying to make a point here? Okay. But like so, the bigger point, you could even say that you had some of that as well because we were absolutely. in the right place at the right time, in the right time of the growth of the internet with this subculture, and then the book, the game came out, and we were all able to leverage that. But, so again, part of it was right place at the right time. 99% of the shit that happens in your life you don't even have any influence on it all. But like that 1% of us actually do, making it happen. Look at who was like the grandfather of this shit. Neil's Mystery, Eric, yeah. Eric fucking Von Markovic or whatever, right? What is he doing now? I have no idea. Crying on Facebook. Love Eric, great guy. But literally like having like a freak out. Why wasn't he successful when he was the progenitor? Why? <laughs> he wasn't able to do the boring ass fucking shit. He's like, this is boring. It's not fun. And he wasn't able to like look at sales, look at marketing, get an IT team together, get a legal team together, write boring sales copy, fucking edit videos, all this crap that we do. You think it's just like this big party of like this orgy in the back of a van. And yeah, you, people are so shocked when they join RSD. They're so shocked. They're like he just kind of sits here and edits you know, videos. You, you do know what we are, right? We're video editors who occasionally teach. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, Eric is like my great mentor of my 20s. You love Eric. His game is amazing. Yeah. Oh, let's clarify that. Eric, no, Eric and Jeff are friends. I'm friends with Eric. Phenomenal. Okay. This is like our great mentor, but it's been, you know, he just, his potential is to be like the, the god. You know, I mean, Eric is the god to us. So that's why, like us as a group, when we see somebody who had so much more talent than any of us had, we kind of look at that. And he, and he has had a great success, but not maybe the success. That, and I think he would be open about this, not the success that he's capable of because of the fact that maybe he didn't want to sit there doing the boring bullshit, right? And so the main, thi the main thing is you get lucky, but what do you do with that luck? And then do you, what do you recognize when you're getting lucky? When the book The Game came out, yeah, I look like the biggest tool in the fucking world, but did anyone who here ever read the book The Game? Anybody read it? Okay. So are you guys surprised that you even like RSD? <laughs> so now, but at the same time, I still recognize I'm getting lucky. So what I did was I, I, I just buckled down for like three years, taught myself marketing, taught myself how to create products, taught myself how to create great email lists, blogging, writing, because I knew this is a very rare opportunity. So many people, I'll invite them out to do, to do big things with me. And then they're like, um, let me think about it. And then they say no, and they kind of do their own thing. Two or three years later, as I advance, they're like, I changed my mind. I want to come back and do big things with you. And I'm like, who are you? 
And they're like, yeah, you know, you said before that we're gonna do big things. I'm like, who are you again? What? Oh yeah. And they thought it would always be like that. My thing is like, if I see an opportunity, I skip sleep. I like, okay, so conflicting paradigm. Abundance of opportunity, scarcity of opportunity. The lowest paradigm is the unthinking masses. They think there's no opportunity. They're just like, I could never be successful. Then from there, you get abundance of opportunity. Actually, there's lots of chances to be successful in the world. From there though, guys, you gotta take it full circle. Massive fucking scarcity of opportunity. And if you see a chance to do something big, you fucking go do it. And the reason why is because there's only so many chances in your life to really hit it big. You get a small couple of them. And when you see it coming, I view that as actually a spiritual thing. That's God's way of saying, yo dude, this is your chance. You're gonna do it or not. And if you don't do it, you're like, abundance, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> you can, you'll get this in your next life, maybe you idiot. So yeah, so I see people that don't take off opportunity with me and I'm just like you're crazy man and but another big one too is that maybe they do take the opportunity with me but then all they do is they focus on the negative in that opportunity and there's so there's like it's like 98 percent amazing shit that like the odds of that even happening are so low but because they're addicted on low vibration energy they keep focusing on the two percent that's wrong rather than helping to fix it and then the complaints stack up and then they fuck themselves but look at that too like when we were first starting out you talk about like being able to persevere through the boring shit the painful shit we were sleeping on floors like sleeping like we wouldn't be holding the event in a room like this. We would go to like Starbucks and one guy bought, buys like a tall coffee and then 30 guys in the corner are like, pussy, durr, while people are like, what the fuck? Yeah, we ran our events in Starbucks, guys. One time we were in Sydney, Australia, we went to like an AIDS clinic and we said, excuse me, we're gay, can we, and we have AIDS, can we run an event in your room, like for a support group? Like a big stretch, empty, right? empty classrooms in the snow on milk crate seminars? You know, and it's like back then though, like when we were doing that stuff, sleeping on the floors and all the shit, like were we unhappy? I thought it was awesome. I'm like, this is great. I've never been to Australia before. I'm gay, I have AIDS, woo! Like, you know, like, you know, and, and, and again, it's like, it's like if you ask us, it's curable. If, if you, <laughs> and again, if in like in 10 years, we're giving like, you know, these events in like, you know, a convention center or something, you're like, oh shit, remember 2017, you're giving these little 200 person fucking fuck arounds in the hotel room. Like, that was awesome too. And like going back to what he was talking about, um, you know, when he had that Satori experience, you mentioned Eckhart Tolle, what's the quote? It's like, there's two ways to go crazy. One is to not have what you want, one is to get what you want. Because when you don't have what you want, at least there's hope. But when you get what you want, and you're still the same like miserable little fuck, like now there's no hope. You're like, well, I got it all, what now? So you gotta come at it from a place where you're happy now with what you got. And then, you know, you, you just enjoy the process. Yeah, be grateful for what you have now. Another one Jeff always busts me on a lot because I can fall off this a lot, is he, is he always says to me, he's like, if he sees me kind of like try to rush to get somewhere in a way that's like very anxiety filled, he's like, let's get to the future, Owen. <laughs> Owen, let's get to the future. Do you guys know, do you follow Eckhart Tolle? Because Eckhart Tolle, he has this thing where he imitates the ego and he's like, <laughs> and like, because imitating the ego is like kind of like dense energy. It's like, let's get to the future. Like, I don't like. Yeah, when he's funny, he's actually gonna be quite funny. And he's like, and he's like, he's like, I don't like it here. Let's get to the future. Yeah, he can be hella funny, dude. He's pretty funny when he wants to be. Okay, so by the way, so main point. So I'm gonna make this in two separate videos. But the main point of this video here, I hope that you got out of it, is we try to cover a lot about inner game outer game, the decision to engage, and kind of like some overarching life philosophy stuff. And I like including crazy examples like, you know, the bow with the girls twerking, or, you know, like, like being sitting in the snow, like wishing you're dead and suicide, like a lot of, I try to kind of hit some intense notes to wake you up and to get you focused. I really enjoy looking at extreme examples of things to kind of bring things into focus. Like right now, say we go quiet for a minute, just go like quiet for just a second and, and tell me what you hear if we go quiet. Air conditioning. You got it. Okay, be, okay, be quiet, okay, be quiet for a sec, okay? How loud is that air conditioning? Be quiet for a sec. It's actually kind of loud, right? It's like, right? Now, and for those of you who couldn't hear it, congratulations, you've been out a lot clubbing and have tinnitus. So, so, because none of us could hear it. We just we have been told. So, so if you look at that, right, you couldn't hear that. But then when you put a focus on it, you can hear it. So we try to cover a lot of extreme examples to allow you to really focus your mind 
on these things. I think, look, life is so, so short. And you know, when I make jokes about things like, you'll be dead soon anywhere, things like that, these are, look, these are kind of like, these are tools that I'm using to try to jar you out of your autopilot derp state, okay? So when I, even when I make extreme statements like suicide, like stuff like that, okay? Sensitive issues, I understand that. But I'm trying to get you thinking outside the box. I like the seminar to be a little bit like a psychedelic drug, drug trip, right? So it's like, whoa, right? Like I saw fucking bitches twerking, and I, whoa, right? So I'm trying to get you thinking a little bit outside the box here, and I'm trying to kind of expand your consciousness or expand your ways of thinking. What I'd like you to do though in conclusion is I'd really like you to look at yourself and look at your life and look at the trajectory of your life and get outside of the, of the assumptions that you completely take for granted. Realize that getting to some goal isn't necessarily gonna make you happy, but also realize that just being happy while doing nothing isn't necessarily gonna make you happy. This is a journey and the journey itself is the greatest reward. We learned here even how to make yourself happy just by default. And we've also covered in RSC a lot of the how-to stuff, which we're gonna cover in our social media section, which is gonna be completely incredible. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that.